We are uh, in a series called New Year's Revolution because New Year's resolutions don't work, uh, and we've uh, kind of established that. If you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go online, watch that message, because it really is kind of foundational for anything. Like for the rest of your life, if you want to change, you want to grow, you want to be transformed in the way you live, and I think most of us do in one way, shape, or form, it all starts there. So let me encourage you to go back and watch last week's message. It is worth your time. Um, what we talked about in, a, in a kind of in a, in a nutshell is the idea that who you are will determine how you live. It comes from the inside and works its way out. Any meaningful change that you want to, to uh, launch in your life has to start inside. It has to start in here. It, starts, it really starts with inviting Jesus into your heart because you can't change your heart by yourself. You need God to do that. And as God begins to do that, it begins to be lived out on the, on the outside. We talked about the idea that our heart is Christ's home, and when we invite him in, he comes and he lives in our, our hearts. But there are various rooms to our heart, our, the home that Christ comes and lives in. And he makes his way around to these different rooms, and we have an opportunity to invite him into that room and surrender that area of our life. So it might be, you know, it might be the bedroom or it might be the, the office or it might be the, the TV room or whatever. And, and so, and all those things, all that th that represents. And so we can invite him into those rooms and surrender that area of our life to him or what we often do is send him back to the living room, right? And say, <laughs> I want this room for me. But real transformation begins to happen as we allow him to transform each of those rooms as we allow him to be Lord of each of those rooms. Now, um, this sounds kind of like this inside out kind of change. Jesus does the rewiring, everything goes good from there. This sounds really easy, right? And eh, not really. Uh, I mean, it is because it's him doing what we can't do ourselves, but we do have a part to play in this. Where this goes horribly wrong is when people begin to believe that what we do doesn't matter. How we live doesn't really matter. Jesus has to forgive us anyway, and it's all him on the inside. And so <clears throat> what I choose to do and, and don't do doesn't matter. And if you have any common sense about you, you know that's not true. You know that's not the way that life works. There is a part that we have to play. In fact, what we do, what we choose to do and not do is how we surrender those rooms to God. I can say that I'm surrendered, but if I'm not living it out, then am I? Not really. Not really. See, this is almost all, well, let me back up, as Westerners, people who think like Westerners, we like, to, we like, we like an either-or mentality. It's, it's one or the other. It's either inside or it's outside. You know, transformation either happens by changing our habits or transformation happens by what God does inside. But, but really, it's both. It has to start inside. It has to start with a change of heart. But what we do matters. Almost like when you look at, at the biblical perspective, it's almost always a both and. It's almost always both. And it certainly is here. It's heart change and behavior change. And the two work together to create a revolution in our lives. Let me give you an example. Say I have an experience, uh, a health crisis this week, and I go to the doctor, and the doctor runs all the tests, and he goes, Chris, you're not going to make it if you don't start to exercise. He kind of puts the fear of God into me, right? And, and so I have this, this heart change, and I evaluate my life and what I'm doing, and, and I have a sincere change in my heart, like I, gotta, I want to start to exercise. I got to start to exercise. What happens if I don't start to exercise? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, eventually, yeah, eventually I, I, eventually I don't make it. But, but if I have, it's January, I'm going, to, I'm going to, you know, I have this heart change to, to exercise. But I don't exercise, that heart change isn't going to be sustainable in my life. In fact, that will start to peter out over time, won't it? it, it it'll go away. It's not sustainable. And Unless I begin to walk or run or swim, get off the couch, get out from in front of the computer and move, I don't experience the benefits of exercise. I don't start to crave exercise like you do if you exercise regularly. And, and what happens if I do begin to do those things is that what I'm doing, my habits begin to work with the heart change and it becomes an established thing in my life. I've, it's a revolution. 
Now, we talked last week about the fact that 80% of the people who sign up to join a health club in January are gone by May, and that's because they, that's because they change their behavior without a change of heart. It's not sustainable. It doesn't last. But if we change our hearts, or God begins to change our heart, and we don't cooperate with our behavior, we end up in the same exact place. It doesn't last. The change of heart doesn't last. It starts to wither on the vine, so to speak. Uh, so it starts on the inside. It has to start on the inside. It starts with God transforming our hearts and changing us from the inside out. But we, it starts, you know, transformation starts with habitation. But what we do matters. What we, how we respond, the habits that we establish in response to what's going on in our heart are really, really important. If you want to become more loving, part of what we have to do is choose to love. You know, when I was in, in my 20s, I was going through a, a dark time, kind of a kind of mild depression. I felt like my heart was numb. You ever been that place where you just felt like your heart was numb? Maybe you haven't, I have. Um, and, and, and I read that passage of scripture where they asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment in all the scriptures? You remember what he said? Love God with everything you are and love your neighbor as yourself. And I realized in that moment that I wasn't loving God with everything I was. I was kind of numb inside. And I wasn't loving people very well either because I was numb inside. And I also realized in that moment that all the habits in the world, you know, reading my Bible every day, going to church, doing, doing all the things I was supposed to do, wasn't making me more loving. That there was nothing I could do externally to change my heart. I had to cry out to God and say, God, would you put love in my heart? Would you change this from the inside? And I started on a process. It was a journey of him bringing my heart back to life so that I could love that way. But I also had to choose to be loving. I had to choose to do loving things. Uh, it, was a, it was a both and, and it was, and it was a journey for me. I'm not going to become, and you're not going to become more loving unless you choose to love. Love is a verb. It's a decision. It's an action every bit as much as it is an emotion and a feeling and a condition of your heart. I love Jesus uh, t teaching his disciples, said this in Matthew 5, but I tell you, love your enemies. All right, so we're supposed to have this, this compassion and love for our enemies in our hearts, but then he puts an action with it and pray for those who persecute you. It's not just feel it, but do it. Another place he says, if a Roman soldier who would have been considered their enemies tells you to carry their pack for a mile, which they could do by law for one mile, he said, carry it too. That's where we get the expression, you know, go the extra mile. Got that from Jesus. Um, but it, it, it practically show them love. Choose to love them and serve them. If you want to become more loving, you have to ask God to do a revolution in your heart, to put love in your heart, but you have to choose to be loving, and the two will work together to revolutionize your life. Is this making sense? Are you guys tracking with me on this? This is really, really important because we get, we love to just hang out on the side of, well, God will give me warm fuzzies and, you know, what I do doesn't matter because that's easy, but it doesn't work. Our lives aren't transformed. Or, if you're a doer, you like to hang out on the side of, well, I'll just do and do and do and do, and my heart won't follow along. It's a both and. We have to work on the inside and the outside. And really, the inside work is the powerful work of God in our lives. What we do, though, is how we cooperate with God. It's how we surrender to God. If you want to be generous, ask for a generous heart, and then start the practice and the discipline of being generous. And the two will work together to revolutionize that part of your life. James chapter 2, verse 17, James is a half-brother of Jesus, and he said this. He said, faith by itself is not accomplished, or if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. He's like, you can have all the belief in, you want, you can have in, your, in your life that you want. You can have all the, the heart change that you want. But if you're not doing what it is you believe, if you're not doing what it is that God is put, changing in your heart, it's dead. It's going to wither. It's not going to last. It's both and. Turn to your neighbor and say both and. Together... These two things create a personal revolution, a New Year revolution when it's January, I guess. 
So Jesus comes and lives in our hearts. It all begins there. It all begins with his presence inside of us. It's the only thing that can change your heart is him. And he starts exploring. He starts exploring these different rooms. And today, we're gonna, Jesus is going to walk into the workshop. The workshop is that room in our life where we use our skills and talents and gifts, the things that he's given us, where we build things, where we, where we make things happen, so to speak. And you have a choice. Does Jesus get this room? Does he get to be Lord of this room? Are you going to surrender this room of your skills and talents and gifts to him, or are you going to send him back to the living room? Now, God gives you skills and talents and gifts for three reasons. He gives you, he gives you them for your, <laughs> your enjoyment. He gives them to you for your enjoyment. You know, God wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to enjoy hobbies. We call these hobbies. If you love to cook or if you love computers or if you love music, he wants you to enjoy that. He wants that to bring fulfillment to your life. It's a good thing. That's one of the reasons he gave you the gifts and talents and skills that he gave you. The second reason is for your employment, so that you can make a living and feed your family and pay the bills and, and all of that. And he's given you gifts and talents and skills so that you can be productive and part of society and you can provide for your family, and that's a good thing too. But there's a third reason that he gave you the gifts and talents and skills that he's given you. And if you're only spending your gifts and talents and skills on the first two, you're missing out. It's an incomplete picture. And that third reason is for his deployment. His deployment. Your ministry, the thing that he's created you to do to have an impact in this world to make a difference for his kingdom. And every one of us, if you're a follower of Jesus, has a ministry, whether you know it or not, and you might not even have a picture in your mind of what that possibly could be, but you have one. He gave you purpose. He gave you talents. He gave you gifts. And if you're not spending at least part of that on, what, on, on his work, on his kingdom, you're missing out on the most fulfilling thing there is in life. The greatest satisfaction that you will find in this world is using what God has given you to serve him and to serve others. You know, I talk to, to people all the time, people, wildly successful people, wildly unsuccessful people. I talk to people from, you know, financially uh, prosperous to not prosperous at all, everything in between. But here is what I find consistently, when I, and it doesn't matter what they, what they do, how much they make, or any of that. When I talk to people who are not using their lives to serve God in some way, shape, or form, the purpose conversation always bubbles to the top. Like, I got all this, look at all I've got, look at all the success I've had, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Like there's no purpose. And that's because the purpose that we were made for is serving God and serving other people. And if we're not doing that, then you're missing out. And the reason he gave you some of the gifts and talents that you have is so that you could use those and to, to be fruitful in his kingdom and be a part of what he's doing. The single greatest impact you will have in this world will be in partnership with God. The single greatest impact you will have will be in partnership with God. You know, we, people talk all the time about the kind of the buzzword today is I want to contribute, I want to make a difference, I want, to, I want to have an impact with my life. The single greatest impact you will have in this world will be in partnership with God, period. Through the church, working with a team of people, empowered by God, outrageously loving the world around us, helping them to find and follow God. We were all created for this. It's huge. This is, this is, this is eventually, and for, for us today, Jesus will walk into your workshop and say, hmm, what are we doing with all this? Like, I think we could accomplish a lot with this. The other room that Jesus is going to walk into today is the kitchen. Walk into the kitchen. What's going on in here? What's happening in the kitchen? 
You know, and in the kitchen, if it's a large family, you know, everybody has a different role to play. Maybe somebody's making the, the main dish, somebody else is making the desserts, or a team of people are putting the salad together. Another, another couple folks are working on, on setting the table, somebody else working on cleaning up after dinner. There's always, always something to be done, and in a healthy family, everybody's willing to jump in and help along the way. And, and so Jesus walks into the kitchen and, and is like, is this, is this running like a team? This is running like a team. You know, the interesting thing about Jesus is he, he, chose, he chose to work in a team. He chose to work with a team of people. Now, when you think about it, Jesus is the Lord of the universe. He's God with skin on. He could have snapped his fingers and accomplished everything that needed to accomplish in his ministry while he was here, but he didn't do that. He worked with a group of people, and not just any people. He worked with a group of people who were at the very best average if not below average. Uh, and especially in the matter of, of religious stuff, they were below average. They wouldn't have never made the cut. These guys were fishermen and accountants and, and politicians, and they were, they, 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 were, they were just people like you and me. They didn't probably see a whole lot of potential in themselves, but Jesus saw potential in them. And I think the reason Jesus chose this team of people was because he saw the potential in them that they didn't see. He saw that, that they could reach their full potential. You know, these guys go on, these ordinary guys, they're from, they're from Galilee, which is kind of this just back, I mean, middle of nowhere, nothing good comes out of Galilee, nothing, you know, I mean, they, they talked with an accent, they talked like they were from like West Virginia, and, 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 and they were just not considered the brightest bulbs in the pack. And, uh, and Jesus sees something in them. And he brings them together as a team. And he begins to speak into their lives and begins to empower them to do the work of God. And their lives are transformed in the process. And these guys go on to change the stinking world. Like every person that we know from that area, unless you're a historian who specializes in that area, every person we know from that area that you would be familiar with, we know through these guys. Like they were the ones that made them famous, other than Spartacus. And the only reason we know Spartacus is they made a movie about Spartacus. But other than that, that era, it all, you know, it's Caesar Augustus, all of them, we, it's, uh, Pilate, we know them because of this little group, ragtag group of guys who go from below average to changing the entire world. And I think God sees that same potential in you, and he sees that same potential in me. And it comes out as we serve together. You have that potential, and if you don't see it, Jesus does. And it comes out and it is developed as we serve together. And when we work together as a team, not only does, or, or we develop, not only does the potential that is inherent inside of you begin to emerge, but you get to be a part of something that has a huge impact, bigger than you. We call it synergy. In, the, in kind of the leadership world, they call it, call it synergy. Synergy is when the sum of the parts is greater than the parts. And if you've ever been on a team of people who are clicking, you ever been on a team of people who are clicking and it's just like everybody's playing their part and all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, what we're accomplishing, I could never, if, there, if there's 10 people on the team and you realize if there were 10 of me, I would never be this effective. It's fun and it's stunning, it's beautiful to see. We are capable of the impossible when we work together on a team like that. Able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine and it's a good time. When I, was in, um, when I was in college, I spent two summers down in the mountains of North Carolina working at a, at a wilderness program called Pioneer Plunge. And we would meet up with about 35 uh, high school students, and we would hike them up into the mountains, we had the western North Carolina mountains, beautiful uh, spot. And we would hike them up into this area that we had, we had been building and had been built over a series of years called Pioneer Plunge. And so they would live in, commu in this community, about 40 of us total, um, and, and just live off the land for two weeks. It was really, really quite a cool experience. I've got a picture of one of the cabins we built. We built cabins, um, 
built, that, see that, that table on the front porch there, we'd sit 40 people around it and we'd eat, eat meals that we cooked over a wood stove um, and three meals a day and we'd tell our life stories and, and listen to what's going on. But then we would get together in these teams and we would go out, about 10 people on a team would go out. And so we had a team that would cook from scratch three meals a day, so we would rotate. So they would do that one day, and then the next day they'd go do something else. But they would learn to make, you know, biscuits and grits. And oh, I love grits. Yeah, any, any grit fans? Grits down south. Cheese grits? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, anyway, I'm sorry. I, I get distracted with food. It's an Italian thing. Um, and so... But they would cook on, the, on a wood stove, and they, I mean, they'd never done, these kids never done anything like that. They were baking apple pies, and just, it was just amazing. And, and just watch this potential come out of them, and watch them kind of come together as a team. And then another team would be building a cabin, or working on a spring house, or they had a team that just went out and cut firewood because you had to keep the wood stove going to feed the, you know, so we had all these different teams. And it was amazing what got accomplished. It was just uh, one day I, I, we needed some, some firewood, and most of the, the trees that grew around us were poplar, which are really great for building cabins, but not great for firewood. And so we needed to find a hotter burning uh, wood, and I found this oak tree up on the mountain. I mean, a big, dead oak tree, like huge. And so oh, I failed to mention that all the tools we had were from the 1850s. So we didn't have chainsaws, we didn't have power equipment, none of that. It was all two-man saws and axes and, and all of that. And so I grabbed these high school kids, and we went up on the mountain to this tree, and I said, this is the tree we're going to cut down. And they all looked at it like, are you kidding me? I mean, it was huge. And uh, nope, this is what we're going to do. So we started swinging on it with the axe and cut the little wedge in it because that was the direction that was actually a big wedge because it was a big tree. This is the direction we want it to fall. And, and then we came back around with the two-man saw. And, you know, you, you pull, don't push the two-man saw. And we're cutting and cutting and then put in the wedges. And, and eventually we get to the point where this tree is just ready to go and everybody stands back and we do the final cuts and it just starts creaking and creaking. And this is a huge, did I mention this is a huge tree? And this tree go, goes, it goes right where we, we wanted it to go, just it was perfect. It hits the ground and the whole, the whole earth shakes. I mean, it was like, if, if you've ever been next to a tree that big that falls, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, um, and they're like, woo, we did it. You know, and we did, it was a huge accomplishment. And then it began to settle in that now we have to figure out how to get this tree back to camp because we're up on the mountain. You know, and so we went about cutting this tree into about 10 foot chunks and they, they have these clamps that you have on come down and clamp into the tree. And so with 10 people in these clamps and a 10 foot, I mean, you know, thousand pound log or whatever, lift and carry. And you know what? When you get 10 people working together, you can do more than you can do by yourself. It was amazing. We got that entire tree down to camp, cut up, made into firewood, fed the stove, kept everything going. And it was, it was stunning what we could accomplish, the cabins that we built, everything else was stunning. It was awesome to be a part of because, again, people were discovering things about themselves. And that was probably the most profound part of the entire experience is not what we got done, as neat as that was, but what happened in the lives of the people who were doing it. It, it was transformative. For them, we, we became a family. We laughed, we cried, we experienced victories, we shared our stories. We walked through failures together. We did some things that didn't work. It was absolutely powerful. And that's the power of serving together with a team of people. And guys, that's a picture of what the church is supposed to be. Teams of people serving together, accomplishing the impossible, transform, transforming people's lives and I don't know about you, but as I look at the world, there's a lot of life transformation that needs to go on. There's a lot of hope that needs to be spread. There's a lot of Jesus that's needed in the lives of people. And it's going to take a team of people working together, becoming everything that we were created to be, but in the process of the synergistic experience of, of, of transforming the world around us. That's the church. That's what we're supposed to be. And our lives get transformed in the process, and we get to be a part of making a difference with what God has given us. Pretty cool. You're going to spend your life on something. What are you spending it on? You're going to spend your life on something. What are you going to spend it on? Now, I'm not suggesting that we all need to quit our jobs and volunteer at the church full time. 
Just want to be up front and clear with that. But I do want to challenge you that if you are not using what God has given you to serve him in the context of a team like that, then you need to figure out how to get that into your life because you're missing out. You're missing out. I'm calling this message Volunteer Revolution because I believe that God wants to revolutionize your life through service, through being a part of something like this. And I think he just walked into your workshop and he just walked into your kitchen and he said, hmm, what are we doing here? And now you have a choice. You can send him back to the living room or you can say, Lord, be Lord of this part of my life too. Now, as I read the scripture, what I, what I see over and over again, especially the New Testament, but the whole, the whole Bible, is that service is part of the Christian life. Like, this is not one of those optional things. Like, oh, that's a module I'll add someday. You know, no, like, there's no such thing as a non-serving Christian. We are servants. Saved people serve people. That's what we do. That's who we are. And I wouldn't serve you well as your pastor if I didn't mention that there is an accountability side of this too. I love talking about the, cool, the, the synergistic side. I love talking about the potential side. I love talking about having an impact. I love all that stuff. And all of it is true. All of it is what we were made for. And it's awesome. But Jesus was also very clear that there is an accountability for what we do with what we've been given. Matthew 25, verse 14, he says this. He uses this story to illustrate this exact point. He says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So this guy got five bags, and he took it, and he invested it, and he, did, he used it to be fruitful for his master. He, he gained five more bags. The next guy said, so also the one who had two bags of gold, gold gained two more. So he did, he did the same thing. Now, one thing I want to point out at this point is everybody got a different number of, of gold coins which is a metaphor for what God has given us, which he has given us our time, our talents, our gifts, our treasure, all of that. What are you doing with it? We all have different amounts. It doesn't matter what you've been, what you've got. What it matters is what you're doing with what you've been given. You ever meet somebody who can just do anything? You know, I hate those guys. You know, they'll go out and build their garage and then, or build a house, and while they're doing that, they're running a business, and then they're playing music on the weekends. And I'm like, how do you do that? You know, but it doesn't matter how many talents. Maybe you have one talent. It doesn't matter. What are you doing with the talent you've been giving? And are you being fruitful for God this is the question. Verse 18 says, but the man who had received one bag went off and dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. This guy took what God had given him and he buried it. He buried it. I think the equivalent of that today is when we take what God has given us and we use it on ourselves only. We use it for our employment and our enjoyment and we neglect his deployment. I think that's the equivalent. It says, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, and this is what I want you to hear at the end of your life when you stand before God and give an account for what you've done with your life. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. See, when we are faithful with what God has given us, when we use that to be fruitful for him, to to grow his kingdom, he not only praises us, he blesses us, he entrusts us with more. It says, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold See, I've gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. It doesn't matter that he only brought two bags and the other guy brought five. It's what we do with what we got. Then 
Then the, mas- the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed, so I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. This guy's just making excuses. He's just making excuses. So I was afraid and went out and, and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, and this is what I don't want anybody who is part of this church to hear when you stand before God and give an account of your life. You wicked, lazy servant. Whew. That's harsh. I mean, you, you, Lord of the universe saying, you wicked, lazy servant. Uh, that's just harsh. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. You should, have, you should have used it to be fruitful for me, he's saying. You could have at least done the minimum, you know. You could have at least put it in the bank and got some interest for it. You could have at least, you know, I mean, volunteered once a year, you know, <laughs> or, or done, you could have done something with it, but just to bury it. I can't believe you've done this. And we do this. We do this when we become self-absorbed. We do this when we spend our lives solely on our own entertainment and provision. When we miss out on the joy of fruitfulness in this life and in the next life. See, I believe that God wants to fill your heart with love and compassion. I think he wants to put a passion in in your heart for people who are far from him. And for people in general, passion to serve him and to serve others. I think God wants to grow your heart three sizes today. And then you can be just like the Grinch. He does. He wants us to have his heart for the world around us. And for some of us, we have that. but We don't have the application part going yet. And for others of us, we don't have that. And that's okay. Just be honest about where you are and ask God to begin to do that in you. And that is a prayer that he will answer. And I want to invite you to pray that prayer right now. Say, God, I'm surrendering this part of my heart to you, and I want a heart that longs to serve you and serve other people. And if you want to pray that, I'm, I'm, this is the month of prayer, so I'm, I'm going, to, going to pray a prayer uh, right now that you can just pray follow along with, just repeat after me and, and, uh, and, and just pray this. If you need to ask God to give you a heart that is fired up about serving him and serving others and growing into who you were created to be and having the impact that you were created to have, then pray this prayer with me right now. Let's just close our eyes, bow our heads, and repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I surrender this part of my heart to you today. I choose to give you my talents and time. Will you grow my heart? Will you fill me with your love for people? And will you help me to find what you want me to do? I am yours. Amen. Amen. That's a good prayer. That's the heart part. And that is something that God will begin to do even right now and will unfold over time from the inside out. But there is an application part because what God is doing in our heart needs to be met with what we are doing with our habits. And so I want to give you an opportunity to sign up to serve. If you are not serving in the church Uh, If you are not on a team, this is part of the deal. You have to begin to do what you want and are praying for God to do in your life. And so I I want to invite you to sign up today. If this is your church, get on a team. And we've got lots of great teams. And make a difference with what God has given you. Now, I know there are some of us that are saying, I'm just too busy to serve. I don't have time to serve. If you're too busy to serve, you're too busy. Like, it's time to step back and evaluate life and go, because I guarantee there are many other things in your life that are out of balance besides this. It's time to step back and, and, and evaluate that. Restructure things, maybe. 
I'm going to have the, the ushers come up the aisles now, and they're going to hand out these cards. It says, uh, I'm ready to serve, or I'm ready to volunteer. And on the back, there's a place where you can just put some co quick contact information, and that we've got several things that you can sign up for real quick and, uh, and begin to serve. And, uh, and be a part of what's going on here. Let me also say up front, this isn't a lifetime sentence. You're not signing up for the, the I mean, you're signing up with God for the rest of your life to serve him, uh, but you're not signing up to be part of any one of these ministries for the rest of your life. It's an ex explorative process, but these are some great places to start. These aren't the only places you can serve in the church, but these are great starting places points to begin to make friends, work on a team, discover where your gifts lie, and to start bringing that potential out and have an impact in the process. And so I'm going to go over these real quick, and I want to invite you to, um, want to invite you to check off one or two. Please don't check off all of them, okay? Because you can't do all of them. Pick your top one or two, or if it's just one, that's, that's great. And if you're already serving here at the church, you don't, have to, you don't have to fill this out, all right? That's just more paperwork. But if you're not already <laughs> serving here at the church, then I really want to encourage you to do that. So the first team is our tech and media team. These guys run the, the, the projectors that you see going on, the lighting, the sound, the graphics, all of that. They build the foundation for the delivery of the message and the music and, uh, and run that a world-class operation are really doing a phenomenal job. If you have computer skills, if you have graphic skills, if you are a, have a theater background, anything like that, this would be a great place to serve. If you check that off, this is high impact, it makes a huge difference, and Ben will follow up with you. Our music arts team, we have a bunch of closet musicians in the church. You're hiding, stop it. God's given you gifts for a reason, and, and so, um, if you have musical gifts, if you play an instrument, uh, if, you, if you sing, of course, we have the American Idol effect as well, too. So we all know that there are people who think they can sing who can't really sing. I don't know if that's you or not, but we'll have to discern that. Um, but at any rate, at least put yourself out there a little bit, say, oh, I'll give this a try, you know, because there are more musicians and there are more uh, vocalists in this church than are currently serving, and you are needed. You're needed. Uh, first impressions team, love this team. These are the people that meet you at the front door, that hand you the program on the way in, that help new folks find the, where the children's ministry is. They're the folks that handed out these cards. There are ushers. They, um, they serve in various ways uh, throughout the church, but they make sure that when you walk in the door, that you are welcomed, that the hospital, oh, the cafe as well, they make the coffee downstairs and make sure people get uh, get welcomed that way. Now, why do we do that? Anybody know? You have no idea. Because this is, this is so huge. Because when people walk into an environment where they are welcomed and where they are loved, guards go down. And when people come to church for the first time, guards are up. But when guards go down, they're able to hear the message, they're able to respond to, the, to God. And one of the comments we get over and over and over again from first-time guests is, I felt so welcomed, it was so warm, it was, it was like walking home. Well, that's intentional. There's a team of people who are out to make that happen. And if you have a big smile and a great handshake or the gift of hospitality, then, uh, then this, is, this is a great place to serve, and it's high-impact um, and so check that off. Mindy will follow up with you this week. Our 180 student ministry. Uh, this is middle school and high school students. Guys, we have a generation of kids growing up a lot without fathers in the, in the home or fathers active in their lives, uh, a lot of brokenness. And they're just dying for, for some adults who will love them where they are, who will be a stable force in their life, will be able to point them towards Jesus and help them Grow. And if you want to have a ministry that can have an impact that will ripple through the generations, this is a vital place. The student ministry, 180. I'd encourage you, um, check that off, and Orrin will follow up with you and, um, and get you, get, let you know what's involved and, and, and help you find a place to serve. Uh, 
Grow Group Leader is the next one. Uh, the you guys are like well-trained dogs. I mean, it's like, um, I love that. All right, so Grow Groups are uh, Grow <laughs> Groups, um, you know, Jesus walked around with a group of 12, 12 people. He had a small group. He had a large group, but he had a small group. And it's in those small, even when I was at Pioneer Plunge, we had those small groups, those small teams. Uh, it's in that small group environment that, that things get real and that life and spiritual growth happens, maturity and all of that. And so we try and recreate that with our grow groups, and uh, you're right, thanks. Um, and so um, maybe you have the skills to facilitate a group, ask some questions, care for a group of people, kind of keep, get things organized, and you could, you could be a, a grow group leader. If that's you, I want to encourage you, mark that off. We have grow groups starting here in three weeks or something like that. And um, we'll train you how to do that. We'll get you the resources you need to win. Um, but create a place where people in the church can, can gather or people in your life can gather and study the Bible and pray and grow and become more like Christ. Powerful power. This is central to who we are as a church. Maybe you don't feel like you could do that, but you have a home that you could gather 10 or 15 people then you could host a group potentially. And so mark that off, just mark that off, same box off, the, the uh, grow group leader, and uh, we will try and hook you up with somebody who can help lead, okay? Uh, and kind of get you together. But this is, this is a huge place to serve in the church, and you will grow and the people you're with will grow. Adventure Kids, this is our children's ministry. Our children's ministry is awesome. This is babies all the way up through the fifth grade. We've got people back there holding babies and praying over them. We've got people teaching the little kids about Jesus on their level. Um, there are all types of opportunities to serve in children's ministry, not just teaching. You can do technology. You can do uh, administrative. We've got people who come in in the middle of the week and prep the curriculum so the teachers are ready to go. Uh, there are a variety of ways to be involved, but this is a great place to serve. And again, this is the next generation. They are coming up quick. One thing I have learned in my sh short years here on earth is that life goes fast and these kids will be leading this church in the blink of an eye. And they need people uh, now who will love them and teach them about Jesus on their level. It's a great way to make a difference. And um, the last one on our list is connections. And connections is simply a team of people who help, pe help people who are new to the church, who are not in involved in the church, take their next steps in the life of the church and their next steps in relationship with Christ. So they organize the membership course and baptism and child dedication, and they follow up with with new folks or people who pray to receive Christ and help them get started and find their way into Alpha and, and, and different things so that they, they don't just have a one-time experience here, but they, their lives are transformed over time. This is a really powerful ministry. And if you sign up for that one, if that's what you have a heart to do that, you've got some skills, organizational skills, some people skills, whatever, mark that off. Kelly will follow up with you. And if there's something that you, you're like, this is burning inside of me, but I don't see it on the list, just write it on the front. We'll talk. Okay? But these are really easy places to start. It may or may not be the place that you end up serving long term, but at least it gets you started. Now, you need to serve long-term. I hope you will serve long-term, but you'll find your way. You'll discover things about yourself, and you're like, oh, I'm passionate about this. And then you, you know, maybe you'll start something, or maybe you'll end up in a completely different area of ministry over time. But serve. Serve. This is what you, part of what you were made for. And again, don't quit your job. But use what God has given you to make a difference for him. This needs to be part of your life. And as you pray and as you continue to ask God to transform you from the inside out, and as you in faith step out and begin to do what you're asking God to do, the two will work together to cr create a transformational revolution in your life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you made us with purpose, 
God, that you've created us to have an impact with our lives. And Lord, thank you for, for wiring things up such that as we do that, as we step in, as we enthusiastically bring what you've given us, God, that you develop us, that you bring our hearts to life, that you pull out the potential that is within us, God, and that we get to experience the thrill of synergy and friendships and community. Lord, I pray that you would do that in this place, in this church, and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.